Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. Before we begin, we have a few basic housekeeping items. We want to bring to your attention an important update regarding the conference schedule. There was an error with the Australian Times for the New York sessions B, D, F, and H on the original schedule. Please visit our website at www.gadmc.org to view the updated and corrected schedule. The Zoom chat has been disabled but we encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A feature box below. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captioning. So if you would like to hear the presentation in a different language, click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of the screen. We encourage you to use the hashtag GADMCONF in all of your social media posts to help raise awareness of the conference. A short evaluation will be made available to you when you exit the session. Your feedback is important to us and will help to shape the next GADMAC conference. Finally, a reminder that the video recording of this and all other presentations will be available later this year once it has been properly edited. It is our privilege to welcome Dr. Rebecca Husted, founder of Technical Large Animal Emergency Rescue. She is internationally known for teaching first responders and veterinarians how to get large animals out of the predicaments they manage to get themselves into. She is here today to share best practices for extricating large animals trapped in unstable ground or in mud. Due to some technical difficulties, we have a recording. Please enjoy. Good morning. I'm glad to talk to you guys today about extricating large animals trapped in unstable ground or mud scenarios. Thank you to the Gavin C committee for selecting my presentation. Why is this relevant to you? Because when somebody has something like this happen to their animal, they're gonna put you in this situation. This is simply a muddy hole, as Jim Green said many years ago, with a ticking time bomb inside of it. So we've gotta be safer for ourselves. And what's interesting is the mud is the same on every side of the planet. It's amazing how many places I go where people say, we don't have mud, and I go, what? <laughs> Everybody has mud. The other reason is, it's never a sunny, warm day where you have these kinds of things happen. It's always cold, it's always rainy, it's always miserable. And the animal is in a situation like this, a quarter mile into the woods. How are we gonna do that? How are we gonna get people there? How are we gonna keep people safe? I, I really enjoy this uh, uh, presentation because this is a chance to tell you guys how to stay safe. So we, Talk about unstable ground and mud rescues, and really that falls into a portion of technical extrication rescue, uh, heavy rescues that include a ground surface that doesn't support the weight of a large animal or potentially a view. Um, that might be mud, septic tanks. Surface ice rescue technically falls into some of these kinds of things. And if you want more information about that, that's available through some of the NFPA uh, standards that are available online. Uh, National Fire Protection Association puts a lot of information out in what used to be NFPA 1670 has now been rolled up with 1983 into the NFPA 2500 that can be found online. And that's just the standard for how you should be doing things and getting your people professionally trained. Before we start talking about mud rescue, I know that we've got some veterinarians here and people who are involved with veterinary care. This is food for thought. How much of these situations is the animal trying desperately to tell us, I've got hot feet, I'm sick, I'm having a problem, I'm laminitic. Um, we find so many animals that are older as well as younger 
in these kinds of situations. This is a horse that has lived in that pasture for many, many years and has never had a problem. And suddenly today he has a problem. So it makes me, hmm, how many of these are attempting to self-medicate? That's something I'd love to have the time to do some research. Fundamentally, mud rescue, unstable ground rescue is a surface area problem. And for trying to explain this situation, I've got pictures here of my shoes. I wear a men's USA size 12 shoe and I'm over 200 pounds or about 100 kilos. And uh, a horse has the same thing. So a 1200 pound horse with four feet is standing on the same area as I'm standing on with two feet. What that means is horses, especially with a smaller shoe size or that are bigger, um, their leg is on a long stick and basically it sticks down in the mud almost five feet. So of course they get stuck. The whole game is the surface area problem, getting them over onto their side and out of the mud. Because when we find them before people start digging, the animals are usually floating on top of the mud. The problem is this cow was floating on top of the mud until people show up and they start digging. And once we start digging, what happens is the mud tends to flow into the hole that we're trying to dig. Uh, this went on for several hours in this particular situation. And you see, you finally have the animal um, strapped up with their webbing, etc. But if you look all the way back here it, at the beginning, it's, it's crazy that um, you know, we keep digging and we just can't see it. So just stop digging. What we talk about as far as best practices is when you stop digging, realize you're digging, just stop. Find a Nicopolis needle, which is a long piece of metal that you can use as a suture needle to go underneath the animal. Attach a pilot line on this side, pull some webbing or a pilot line back, and then attach more webbing to be able to get your sideways drag webbing straps in place. In this presentation, we are not going to talk about vertical lifts. They're difficult to do. They require excellent timing. They take a lot of coordination and PPE, and we will not cover that in this lecture. In this lecture, we're going to do manipulations on the ground. If you get into doing vertical lifts, that's a whole other subset of large animal rescue. So, Safety. We always talk about safety and everybody that knows me knows that I have to say something about a helmet. This is a good example of please wear a helmet, stay out of the kill zone, people positioning. Again, that's not the focus of this presentation, but when we're doing mud rescues, we've got to make sure that we're in the safe position away from the legs, away from where a horse could possibly or a cow could possibly knock us or crush us. Um, it, this gentleman is actually doing something good. He's trying to cut the roots that are trapped around this horse's foot and i understand that but again we have to think about how can we mitigate for safety wear a helmet tie that leg off to a tree do something um, give him a harness to get him out of the way even though this is an exhausted and old horse we don't want to take a chance on getting hurt when we talk, think about mud rescues, we know we're going to need help. So why aren't you calling your veterinarian early on? Why aren't you calling for more people early on? And uh, any of these that are you're going to do hand manipulations, uh, either using your mechanical advantage with a rope system or with people, still requires quite a few people. So uh, call them out for early and worst case, uh, you get it out quickly and you can turn them around. But you're going to need a vet and sometimes it takes the vet a long time to get there. I want to say as far as safety that one of the things that we think about a lot is heads and necks are not anchors. Uh, yes, you can put a halter on there for guidance of the animal, but they are not anchors. Don't put chains or ropes or anything around the head and neck and pull. There are way too many stories out there of people trying to pull cattle out of the mud hole in their pasture and sadly killing the animal. The head and neck are not anchors and neither is the tail. This is an example of a rescue. Uh, you can see that some of the people are standing in many different wrong places. But uh, we don't use tails as anchors. They're not anchor points. Uh, they can really get somebody hurt um, and it can really hurt the animal. So this is an example on the left, a uh, dead horse. And all we did was we picked it up with a tractor uh, just to demonstrate that this can happen. Picked it up and slightly dropped it, caught the animal's tail 
and uh, you can see that the bone is actually separated by about eight inches. That's, uh, thank you very much to the people that donated the horse um, for euthanasia and then were willing to allow me to do something educational like that. The picture on the right is, you know, tells its own story. Um, pulling horses out of mud by their tail uh, can remove their tail and, and or deglove it. There's lots of things that can happen, but just don't use the tail. It's not a handle. In general, heavy equipment is always our last choice. This is an example of one that happened last summer in Texas, and I'm sure these folks thought they were doing some great things, but they were using a winch and a tractor and they used ropes, and the horse died five days later despite treatment and a veterinarian on site, etc. Just stay away from that heavy equipment. If you've got heavy equipment, we talk about using the heavy equipment to make a ramp for access and egress for the animal. Um, keeps us in a safer position, a lot less work. Uh, if you got to wait 30 minutes to get a piece of equipment there, then that's the way it is. Give the animal some hay and keep him busy. In general, the kinds of things that we want to emphasize in any of these kinds of situations is getting an animal handler there, uh, trying to minimize the excitement, using incident command. All the other speakers have talked about those kind of things. Guide the animal with head control. And place your straps, get the animal sternal, that's the sternal is the recovery position, and then allow it to rise on its own when it's ready to. What's interesting is, how many times have you gone to one of these things and you find a muddy hole with some mess in it and there's no horse in it? Healthy horses often extricate themselves, and the easiest way to help them help themselves is to provide some head support, um, at, even if it's field expedient. This is a great situation out in uh, Washington a couple of years ago. Uh, the young lady got on the phone with um, Mustangs for the Rescue. Mustangs for the Rescue said, hey, can you shove something underneath the head so that the head doesn't go down in the mud? And she said, well, I can use some reeds and grass. And that worked out great. Turns out that it made enough of a mat that the horse was able to use that for leverage and get himself out. We always prefer that. In general, uh, when we talk about best practices, we talk about don't immediately remove, remove that saddle. You may be able to, when you remove the saddle, to use the girth that's already underneath the animal to pull your webbing into place. That would uh, obviate the need for having a Nicopolis needle or some other tool to reach underneath the horse. We always want to think about, particularly for animals that are really deep in water or have um, muddy, or in this case, it's not even so much mud, it's more reeds, but you'll notice in the upper right hand side, this is actually David King from over in Australia. He got there first and he's elevating the horse's head out of the water. As soon as somebody gets there with a little bit of uh, equipment, they were able to give him this um, flotation device, shove it up underneath the animal's chin. You're just trying to help him keep his nostrils out of the water. And I don't know what kind of device this is. It's over from the UK, but it looks useful for the horse uh, just to keep his chin out of the water so that his nostrils can breathe. In general, we spend a lot of time talking to Mud Rescue about using simple tools. This is an example of the Hampshire Strop Guide. This is uh, a piece of metal that's got a curve to it, and it's long, and so you've got to imagine it's going underneath the horse. It'll come out on this side. They'll be able to attach a pilot line on this side and pull it back underneath the animal. That allows you to place your straps. Um, anytime we can use extensions of our arm, whether it's a rope or a long reach tool or a strop guide, um, we want to try to do those things to keep ourselves in safe position. Here, this happened, uh, the one on the right actually happened this morning over in, in um, New South Wales in Australia. I saw it on the news this morning. This is a strop guide being used to get underneath this cow to be able to emplace our rope. This is practice using a mannequin uh, doing the same thing here in the U.S. A lot of people bring plywood to the scene, and they, I guess they think that this animal is going to be able to jump up or onto the plywood. That is not true. This is an old picture from Geelong over in Australia. This is Astro. He's a world-famous horse for his mud rescue, and he tried. He's in great shape. He's a jump horse, and he was not able to get up on the plywood and walk out. Uh, it, their hooves are slick. Their legs don't work that way. You can really cause all kinds of problems. So when you bring the plywood or some thing flat. It could be a rescue path, one of the inflatable rescue paths. It could be plywood, could be the rescue glide, something to distribute your weight. We use that for ground support for the people, not for the animals so much. 
In this case, uh, using a ground pad, this is the inflatable rescue path to get this cow out of the mud. Spreads your weight, gives you a working rescue platform. Go from there. Uh, some of the tools that you can use along with your plywood is something called the Nicopolis needle. This is the old version many, many years ago. And these days, this is the modern Nicopolis needle. It has attachment points to be able to either inject water or air, depending on what you need. Uh, there's benefits to both. Uh, there's also pros and cons to both. In um, here, what they're doing is using that suture needle to get underneath the animal and then be able to attach your pilot line and pull it back out from underneath. You can also modify one. This is just a piece of kind of rubber hose or, or plastic hose. And they did do some digging here. You can tell they're still down in the mud. But they use that as a modified Nicopolis needle with some duct tape to be able to pull their webbing back underneath the animal. Sideways dragged are what we generally use for mud rescue, and that is our preference. Uh, sideways drag, pulling away from the legs, so increasing the surface area by rolling the animal onto the mud. Often we will use a rescue glide or a piece of plywood to roll the horse onto, again, to increase its surface area onto that. This is an example of a old horse that was down in a, in a muddy pond lake. We got it next to the edge. And then there's a short video there we go. to demonstrate what the All sideways right. drag is. All right, she should be able to get up and get the energy. All right, look out, kid. This is another example. It's hard to see, but there's actually, they're standing on a piece of plywood that's underneath the water. And so what they're doing is dragging, using a sideways drag, the animal onto the plywood. And then they've got some ropes to attach to the plywood and pull the whole thing, the horse and the plywood out of the situation. Notice this is the veterinarian and he is actually elevating the head, keeping the head out of the water. Um, probably not exactly where I want him to stand, and I would like to see some flotation underneath the chin, but uh, nothing stupid if it works. That's, uh, that's one of the rescue terms, right? Nothing stupid if it works. These days, we have learned a lot about using mud lances, jetting wands, air knives, depending on what you call it, to be able to inject some air next to the animal's leg. If he's really so stuck that we can't get the animal to roll onto his side, we can inject some air or inject some water to break that suction effect. It can be done with the fancy versions. This is four mud lances attached to air um, bottle. Or all the way back to 2009 is Anthony Hatch's picture, um, a field expedient version of the, of, of the same thing. Uh, SCA bottle with a regulator that taped that air hose to the end of a broom straight stick and down next to the legs. Remember, it's got to be a long tool because the horse's legs can be up to five feet long. So how do we bring it all together? We have incident command and we have our reach tools and webbing. We've used our ground support. We've got people in PPE, the correct PPE, and harnesses. Um, we're using head protection for the animal. Notice these are just little pool floaties. Um, we shove them up underneath the animal's chin. In this case, he has a PFD on his head that may provide some flotation, but more than that, it also provides some head protection. And of course, Dr. Becker and others make good head protectors that also have flotation. We're going to use our Nicopolis needle. That's what we're using here with some air injected to be able to get up underneath the animal. And there's a video to demonstrate this. All right, come on, you can do it. Everybody pull, everybody pull. You're getting there. Get in there. Good job. Come on, you can do it. Come on, kiddos. Motivational. This is church. Obviously, that is a horse that is really, really stuck. That's a mannequin. All right. So, lastly, I've got a couple of case scenarios. Uh, this is a horse that was trapped in mud. He's been there for a couple hours. Uh, Little Fork Fire Rescue in Virginia responded to this one. They've got all their folks. Um, in the appropriate positions. Uh, incident commander is directing the operation. This is their training trailer. Um, they do have the world's best logo. We are trained to rescue your ass. <laughs> anyway, uh, obviously the big thing with this horse is getting him out wasn't that hard, but treating him for hypothermia, transporting him to the vet clinic and doing the aftercare is gonna be important. Really older horse and very debilitated in this case. In case two, this is Patterson County Fire Rescue in New York. 
This is a horse that got loose, um, has been gone for several hours. They finally found him in the mud in very dark freezing conditions. The fire department gets there. They call for the veterinarian. The veterinarian's on her way. Um, they attempted to leverage the horse out of the mud using some backboards. In other words, putting the backboards down next to the horse and then rolling the horse into the backboards and plywood. That worked pretty well. Uh, notice that their personnel that are actually in the mud or in the water are wearing the appropriate uh, water rescue gear um, to try to keep themselves from getting cold or wet or both. And here they've rolled the animal laterally onto the plywood um, and black backboards uh, using that cantilever version. And then at this point, he still has a saddle on. Um, they remove the saddle and at this point they're going to, you know, pay attention to the field expedient version of sideways drag is using ropes, but now they've got to pay attention to treating the horse for hypothermia because obviously that's what's going to happen to the horse in this kind of situation. Lastly, for mud rescues, it is very important that we pay attention to hypothermia, dehydration, and provide um, that horse with some, some veterinary treatment, first aid treatment um, in that position because as soon as we get him to sternal and he is able to use both lungs, can we provide him some hay, if the veterinarian says so, to be able to turn on his internal metabolic fires? Um, how are we going to prevent accidental hypothermia? How are we going to prevent that dehydration? And obviously having the veterinarian there as soon as possible is also going to be very helpful. The last case, we have a horse that was ridden into a ditch. Um, this is the owner actually in the purple. She was riding her horse next to a river and was trying to get him down so he could get a drink. And sadly, she didn't understand that there was some very thick reeds and there was a little ditch through there. And so of course her fell, horse fell into it. At this point, the horse has this towel over his head and uh, this is his saddle. This is the, the horse's head and neck here and his butt is over here. And she put a towel over his head to try to, I guess, keep him calm. She called 911 immediately and she called her veterinarian immediately. And then she stayed with the horse. She is mm, maybe about a half a mile from uh, an accessible area. She had to wait a little bit until they could get there. Mustangs to the rescue also got a call, which has a TLR um, mud rescue team. They showed up with their webbing, their head protectors, and Redmond Fire Department also showed up. At this point, they're using they're, they put the head protection on. They're using uh, Dr. Terry Casey's, uh, Casey Terry's arm, which is very long, to be able to reach down, grab the, um, the horse's girth on the saddle. She attached the pilot line to that. And as they took the saddle off, they used that to pull the pilot line with the webbing into place. And then they positioned their webbing around the horse. Good picture of it here. Uh, in this case, they decided they were going to use a forward assist in the Swiss seat or Weidman configuration. And that's what they're busy doing here is wrapping the webbing around. Uh, they also decided that they were going to put a sideways drag webbing on in case they ended up having to use that method if the forward assist didn't work. So um, here we have a Swiss seat on the horse with its head protection. And everybody's here. This is the incident commander uh, directing the operation. She's telling everybody where to go. And interestingly, she said the most important thing was that she needed personnel. So she ended up grabbing a bunch of these people who are the people who are actually kayaking down the river. And as they came down the river, she said, hey, can you guys help us? We need to pull this horse out. And they ended up with plenty of people. At this point, the forward assist allows the horse to come forward. The horse came forward a little bit. It's really pretty tired. Um, it went over onto its side laterally. They rolled it to sternal, gave it a few minutes, and she said it stood right up, and they were able to walk it back successfully. So in conclusion, when we are doing mud rescues, we want to make sure that we're not emphasizing helicopters and, and mechanical and winches and those kind of things. If we're going to use rope systems and a mechanical advantage, that's great, but we need to make sure that we are not using too much um, force on this animal. It's much easier to simply use a sideways drag in most of these situations. We emphasize PPE and wearing a helmet. We want to call for that vet and your personnel early. Uh, use incident command, all the things that we would normally use, whether it was a structure fire or any other kind of large animal rescue. Get that animal handler in, in, to 
to get head control of the animal, we have to decide, do we have to split operations? Sometimes we have some, we have a horse over here, we have a human that's impacted over here, or we may have a horse over here, a cow over there, or more than one horse. Um, do we need to split operations with our team? People positioning and keeping people out of the kill zone. Keep people away from those legs, keep people uh, in a position where they can be effective without getting hurt. Uh, obviously the first aid triage, providing patient care and stabilization of the patient is part of our veterinarian's job, but also part of our job when we're first on scene. We wanna to try to stay on stable ground. We wanna use uh, ground pads. What do we have to do to keep ourselves in a safe position? Use our tools and in place our straps and using extensions of our arm wherever possible. We try to use those simple manipulations, forward assist, sideways drag, backwards drag to extricate the patient. patient. And again, keep it simple. Did I say something about no helicopters and mechanical winches? I greatly appreciate the Global Animal Disaster Management Conference for allowing me to participate and try to educate folks about something I'm really passionate about. We see these around the world and there, there's so much easier ways to do it than doing some of the things that people have done in the past. Glad to see that we have so much participation. If you need to get a hold of me, I have a YouTube webinar playlist with lots of free um, webinars that have been pre-recorded. And there is an international Facebook study group that's relevant to technical large animal emergency rescue. It's a study group, not a prayer group. And you can get a hold of me by my email and my phone number there. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Jimenez, for being with us today and sharing your years of expertise and education and all the wonderful stories that everyone in the group shares with you as well.